Shana Tova, from the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. Each of us here tonight has a personal reason for being here. It's Kol Nidre, the opening service of Yom Kippur, our day of atonement. It's the day we reveal our hard, rougher edges and pray for the strength to buff them out. Tonight is a service of reflection, of confession, and maybe even a little redemption. Some feel joy on Yom Kippur, happy to spiritually air themselves out, fill up with hope for the coming year, and taste the release that comes from telling the truth. For some, though, the truth is not freeing. It is bitter and can make us feel brittle. The poem I read by Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai reveals a truth that each of us will confront at some point today, the consequences of certainty, the damage caused when we in insist we're right. This Yom Kippur, let's spend a little time thinking about our certainty. And let us ask if we've been paying a cost for being too convinced of our own position. Certainty can become stubborn and alienate us from people, even from within our closest circles, and it alienates us from the larger whole of the community. The rabbis taught, Al tifrosh min hatzibur, do not separate yourself from the community. I hope that sounds familiar to some of you. I proclaimed this two years ago from this bima, as we began to emerge from the lockdown of the COVID pandemic. You all remember that. The message then was, we need healing from our isolation that was imposed upon us by an act of God. So show up, enrich, be enriched by the presence of your fellow human being. Show up. It's still true. But today I say again, al tifrosh min hatzibur, do not separate yourself from the community, but today it has a different lesson. Do not separate yourselves from one another. By now, I'm sure we're all familiar with the polarizing of America. The red states, the blue states, echo chambers, with separate information ecosystems. The feeling is we have bifurcated into different Americas, sticking with a tribal flag of our own perspective. On the one hand, we can say that this tribalizing is helping people find community. Sure, but we are casually creating communities of certainty. It is unhealthy to be too comfortable with your own ideas, and it's unhealthy to be too distant from people who disagree with you. I recall hearing about a telling experiment that was done a couple of years ago. 
a large sample of right-wing Fox News watching people were paid money to watch CNN for a whole month. The same time, CNN, MSNBC watchers were paid money to watch Fox News. You can imagine what they thought when they got the phone call. Well, you'd have to pay me. What they found was that although the people still held their fundamental leanings, they ended up thinking that the other side maybe wasn't so crazy that the issues were apparently more complex than they thought and that they felt more hopeful for America. Most important, they felt better about the people on the other side. I think that's a good thing. The painful thing to me was that despite feeling better, all of the subjects went back to watching their own news channels. I guess it's comforting living with uncomplicated thoughts, but this is a dangerous illusion. 19th century British philosopher John Stuart Mill wrote in his On Liberty, he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good, and no one may be able to refute them, but if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. Feeling safe from challenging ideas is not why we're here on this earth. We're here to grow up, to mature, to strive to become what God expected us to become. And God expects us to do this together. Certainty of our own points of view does not allow for very much renewal. Flowers will never grow in the spring. The Jewish tradition has a long history of machloket l'shem shemaim, argument for the sake of heaven. Good faith examination of issues, all ideas, where chevrutot, study partners, who are connected to one, and un uh, one another through their engagement of the text, regularly challenge one another and their ideas. The more a subject is examined, the clearer the thinking, and then the clearer one's understanding. My years in yeshiva taught me to be intellectually humble, that there are always other worthwhile points of view. Sometimes it's up to us to find them out. The Talmud quotes God is saying of the arguments of Hillel and Shammai, two famous rabbis who almost every time they appear disagree. God says of them, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim. These and these are the words of the living God. God is brought to life in arguments made for the sake of heaven. The truth of this is hinted at in the story of our own creation. Genesis 1.18 that we will be reading in just a couple of weeks. Lo tov heyota adam levado e lo ezer kenegdo. It is not good that the human be alone. I will make for it a helper as it were against him. The Hebrew noun is weird. Ezer means helper. Neged means opposite or opposing, against. God's concept of a mate for Adam, 
A proper mate is a partner that supports as well as challenges. As Amichai aptly put it, but doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow. Bertrand Russell wrote, in all affairs, it's a healthy thing now and then to hang a question mark on the things you have long taken for granted. There's a beautiful book on this subject of raising questions and in particularly doubt by Peter Berger and Anton Zitterfeld. In praise of doubt, it's all in the title. In praise of doubt, how to have convictions without becoming a fanatic. In it, they explore how doubt is crucial to the intellectual and moral life. Personally, I think it's what might save us from ourselves. They suggest that questioning one's own values and one's own judgments will lead to more thoughtful and responsible choices Doubt allows us to engage with others' perspectives, fostering understanding and empathy rather than conflict. But there is a kind of certainty that I find especially dangerous, and we are all susceptible to it, dogma. Dogma, doctrines of belief whose truth are accepted rather than proved, builds a certainty that creates fanaticism. It's hard to be in a relationship with a fanatic. Absolute certainty is dangerous. Israeli researcher Shraga Feldman did a very interesting and telling study of teenagers, orthodox, orthodox teenage boys. He found that the boys that were not allowed to entertain doubt as part of their spiritual education, those that were not allowed to entertain doubt wound up with very, as other psychologists would put it, diffuse identity consolidation. In other words, these are fancy words for, they never really settled. They wound up in an ambivalent place in their belief systems. But those that were encouraged to entertain their doubts, and this you can see across the spectrum with adolescents, those that are able to explore opposition. I don't believe this. This doesn't make sense to me. I don't want that. Why? If you're able to entertain those questions, you come through not only with a consolidated idea of who you are, but with far less self-harming behaviors. That's what he found. Casting doubt, even on our own creed, is healthy, says a rabbi on Yom Kippur. Elie Wiesel once said, I have not lost faith in God. I have moments of anger and protest. Sometimes, I've been closer to him for that reason. I think of doubt like the making of an alloy. Steel is, I understand, iron and carbon. The mixture of conviction and doubt left to marinate for a time leads to a lighter and more durable sense of conviction. Doubt allows us to convert our certainty into curiosity. And curiosity is healing. Imagine leading with curiosity 
when you have those conversations with people who think much differently than you do. Imagine rather than ginning up your response before they're done talking, before knowing full well why they're wrong and the three points you're going to nail them with, before doing that, imagine genuinely asking them, that's interesting. What about that idea is so useful and meaningful to you? And then listen to the answer. They may start to lecture. I'll tell you the honest truth. I have found when people first begin meetings, even if they know each other, there's a period of time of having to show up. This is who I am. This is what I think. Every group I've ever been in, the first meeting is a lot of talking, not a lot of listening. So imagine you taking that spiritual step and say, tell me about that. What is so animating about that perspective? How did you get there? If you are gifted with a serious conversation, there's no guarantee of that. You might be sur surprised to find, just like the people in the study, that maybe they're not completely crazy. That maybe there are some legitimate ideas buried underneath the hype. You may disagree with them. You may even still find them to be wrong. That's fine. But you'll have begun plowing the earth of the heart and making it fertile for new, for new growth. We come to Yom Kippur to break through our certainties, to expose ourselves with genuine vulnerability to God and to our fellow. May we all merit being inscribed in the book of life for a year of softening, a year of healthy questioning, a vibrant conversation, and lots of new growth. Gamar Chatimah Tovah.